for example, Vivo or Harvard profiles, Harvard catalyst actually. So uh, the question was, is this uh, the Stanford Community Action academic profiles uh, similar to, to Vivo? I mean, that's also a very similar thing. They try to establish profiles as well. So yeah. CAP is a separate um, profiling system from Vivo that's used at a number of other institutions, but it is, but it is very similar to that. OK, that was my just out of the way. I wonder how scalable it is for multiple institutions to do individual feeds into the app, such as you're contemplating. <laughs> so that's the benefit of being the first one. <laughs> um, I mean, right now, the app does have a number of multiple feeds from different national authority files, and it's true they have not worked with a local institution before. Um, it's sort of like when we also were considering doing something with Disney, and I think they're set up working with organizations, and they hadn't considered working with a, a, an individual organization. But I think if you think about it in terms of um, link data, does it really matter? I mean, as long as those, if they can, if they can identify there's a duplicate and they're linked together in some way, um, and the interface presents you with a heading which links the same heading, which may come from UCLA or from Stanford and from Yale, then I don't think it really matters if there are multiple, those multiple headings for the same person, because we know in a link data world that's going to happen anyway. All that really matters is that they're pulled together in some way, and that we have to present that heading, which we pull them all together, then it, would, it, then it wouldn't matter. Um, but yes, it does will bring additional challenges to searching, because you wouldn't want to have to be involved with all those separate headings to search them all individually. I can add a comment to that. Uh, in, in the way that these parts of the world operates, uh, traditionally you would be expecting to send dump files all over the place and, and, and process them. In the link data world, you start to find that as a local um, provider of information, you should be able to look up against data sets and create almost robots doing this kind of thing. And there is already a robot in place, for instance, that's going through Wikidata, which is the new format that's living under the Wikipedia and interconnecting BF to Wikipedia and, and in reverse. And that's just chuntering around away quietly overnight doing a few thousand a day, uh, bringing those, those resources in, in, in chain with each other. At the same time, because of that BF interlinking, there is now this the interlinking because of it happening in, in, inside Wikipedia. So that tends to be the way things happen.
That is our intention, yes. Is uh, it going to exist like clean data so people can harvest it in any yes, form? Yes, it will. Uh, but our intention is to do everything in an open way. Um, it'll be sort of set up like, I'm assuming that the end part will be set up sort of like Orchid, where the individual yeah. faculty will be able to decide what it is they would like to be able to share. So if there's something they would say they do not want to share with the world, we would not. But everything else would be open. Will you uh, give them an access so they can update their own profile to their liking? So yes, so the whole idea, well, yes. <laughs> yes? <laughs> yeah. You know, it depends on which part you're talking about. So the, the, the cap part, the community academic profile, is totally under the control of the individual faculty member. They have to do all the work. Uh, yeah. We won't do anything for them other than feed them the works. And then, of course, the way it's worked in the medical school is none of the faculty want to do their own work. So they give it to a graduate assistant, or they give it to the admin, and they do all the work. But it's up to them to do that sort of work. The Stanford Authority file, which supports those profiles and feeds them the work, is the thing which uh, the libraries will maintain. And um, the individual professors will never see the Stanford Authority file. They will just get the sort of the output from it delivered to their profile. So when uh, Heather asked you about uh, thinking about mapping the co collaborators, uh, and you said you haven't thought how you're going to yeah. do that, maybe you would like to look at the D3JS tool. D3JS tool? Yes. You're going to find amazing stuff. <laughs> you're going to need some programmers to help you yes. with that. Yes. So and they're gonna do amazing stuff for you. I'm telling you because I'm working on people. <laughs> they let me do Yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> yes. Uh, Linda Barnhart, University of California, San Diego. I'm gonna shift the spotlight back to Richard and um, ask you to talk a little bit more to explain and perhaps give us some reassurance about this complementary nature between schema.org and BibFrame. I wasn't 100% getting why we would do both or would need to do both. And to me, it worries, I worry about redundancy. So I'm not completely understanding the complementary nature of that. Okay, it, it, it's a matter of granularity then. Okay. And how granular a data your potential consumers of your data want. Uh, in, in, in the, the library world in Mark, we've got very, very fine-grained data. And that's all we have. That's all the outside world can consume, which basically means they don't consume it. It's, it's too deep and detailed. But we need the richness of information effectively to run our libraries with and, and exchange information. And that's where we're trying. It's one of the objectives of BitFrame is to deliver a rich vocabulary, a big, rich ontology structure, so that we can capture in a linked data way the fidelity of what we've already got. So what we need to be able to do is to satisfy the other side of the equation, the consumers who are just looking into a coarse-grained way of consuming our data to guide people to our resources. Once they are at those resources, they can even consume data at the coarse-grained level or a fine grain one. I understand your point about redundancy, mm -hmm. and this is where the systems that develop right. the, these um, data sets are going to have to evolve over time. I think what you'll start to find is the cataloging process will change subtly to, to bring efficiencies. So if we're looking at works descriptions, for instance, a cataloger cataloging a new manifestation should easily find that this is an instance of a work that's already been catalogued, for instance. So a lot of the high-level information will already come in. Also in the background, the mapping between big frame detail formats and schema that all coarse grain formats will happen automatically in the background. It's the way I envisage it happening. Uh, there would need to be, especially as those automatic processes developed, some input from the library community. We're the best people to say, these 15 different flavours of subheadings should be represented in the name of the book, as far as good adults can do some, some, some work in those areas. But this will evolve as, as, as processes build together. If I may uh, offer a suggestion, uh, an example, a specific example. I've been working on data mining WorldCat and representing uniform titles 
NBF in the original language, original script, and we do those every single translation of that work and their translators. And we run into dates. Now, skiwan.org has a date field, and that's it. Well, I want to know the date that was originally published. I want the date of each of those French translations, the dates of each of those English translations. I want to know the dates of the translators. I want all kinds of dates, which Stephen.org doesn't, I mean, it has date. And I think, you know, date of original work versus date of a translator's work in French or Chinese is important for a certain community. So it's an example where you know, for the big broad schemes, you know, a date might work for the rest of the world, but when we're dealing with some of the very specifics we're doing, we want a relationship of date to a specific object that right now isn't there. Yeah, which, which is coming back to the scheme of big extent, delightfully like group that I, that I wrote. Some of the issues we're addressing there, so in that particular environment, we would, would want to describe and interconnect the different manifestations, the different expressions, which could each have their own data information. But aggregate that up to what you might call a Google group, so people can find their way into that structure. And there are some enhancements our group are looking to recommend to skin double. And it's only some small enhancements in that environment to help this broad vocabulary describe the bibliographic world. But this is one of the reasons the implementation of WorldCat is described as experimental. <coughs> the community is evolving some of these processes as we go. Right, Margaret Hughes. Matt, you mentioned um, that the Stanford Authority file includes data for staff as well as students. Presumably, students have not published or not yet published, but their data will also be shared with BIAF. Um, I mean, no, I think a BIAF is something looking or authors or creators or perhaps subjects of works. So I'm not sure. So I guess, um, right, so um, I think Margaret's question was, I mentioned that the standard authority file would include records for students. <clears throat> and students are very rarely authors at that point. So I guess uh, I used the term student a little bit too uh, broadly. I think it was it in the world according to Garth, they called them gradual students. So it was the, it, I'm talking about graduate students mostly in postdocs. So the people that are um, expected to be writing journal articles in order for them to be able to graduate. So that's why they're included, but probably not the undergraduate population. Although um, I, we could if we wanted to, because we'd have all that same information. It does get trickier with students and what sort of information that we, we could possibly share about students. Would there be an academic profile for every student, graduate or undergraduate? So I think the way it's envisaged that for graduate students and postdocs that there would be a cap profile. Um, one of the things I didn't mention, I think in the, at the medical school, they also use them uh, for classes so that they can have chat groups and things like that and discuss um, assignments, written assignments for the day. So they use them for a multiple things. So that's why the students have profiles as well. 